Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our book launch this evening. Uh, my name is Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the launch of the Ink Cloud Reader by Kit Fan. It's his first Carcanet book, um, but his third poetry collection. So this is very exciting for us and I hope just as exciting for you. Um, I'm just gonna run over some housekeeping uh, before I hand over. Um, just so that you know what's going on this evening. So as usual, um, we'll be together for around an hour. Um, Kit is gonna read for us and while he's reading, I'm gonna get the poems up on screen for you as a visual guide. Um, you're in control of your screen this evening. So if you need the poems to be smaller um, and his face to be bigger or anything like that, just have a play around and you should be able to configure it to suit your own needs. If you have any technical problems during the event, pop them in the chat and I'll try my best to help you as we go through this event. Um, please do, yes, also find the chat now, say hello to us. Um, we wanna hear from you, we wanna know like where you're watching from, we want to know what you think of the reading. Um, we'd really like to get you involved in the conversation. And to that end, uh, towards the end of the event, there will be time for some audience questions. So as well as finding the chat, please find another button which says Q&A. Um, if you guys get your questions for Kit lined up in the Q&A box, then we'll be able to answer them later on in the event. So um, thank you all very, very much for paying your two pounds to be here. We really appreciate that. I have already put the discount code and the link in the chat for you, um, but we can do that later in the event as well. And it'll all come as an email tomorrow. So um, not to worry too much about that tonight. Um, now, I'm very pleased that we are joined this evening by Catriona O'Reilly, who is gonna be talking to Kit later on in the event. Um, and she's gonna be introducing him just in a moment for us. So before I ask her to join me on stage, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Catriona, um, who is a poet and a critic. She's published three collections of poetry. Um, the most recent is Gesh. It came out in 2015 with Blood Axe, and she's been widely translated into lots of languages. Um, as I mentioned, she's also a literary critic, and she's a former editor of Poetry Island Review. So it is great to have her here, um, and I'm going to just invite her to join me on screen now so that we can get going. Thanks, Katriona. Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. And thanks to everybody for joining us uh, this evening. And welcome to uh, the celebration, the symposium and celebration of the launch of Kit Fan's third collection of poetry, The Ink Cloud Reader. Kit's previous books of poetry were Paper, Scissors, Stone, which won the Hong Kong University International Poetry Prize, and As Slow As Possible, which was a Poetry Book Society recommendation and was widely praised on its publication in 2018. He is also the author of a novel, Diamond Hill, which was published in 2021, and which the, po which the novelist and critic Charlene Tio, writing in The Guardian, described as a gripping and highly accomplished debut novel with language that is dizzyingly kinetic, um, a descriptor, I think, which also applies very much to his poetry. Kit Fan was born in Hong Kong and he was educated there and in the UK, where he has lived since 2001. His work, therefore, is saturated in the parallels contradictions and convergences between these two cultures, home cultures in a real sense, and many others besides. A reading of the Ink Cloud Reader shows him reaching daringly and ambitiously across these various cultures, along the axes of space and time, in a way that remains axiomatically anti-reductive always, and alive to the play of nuance, of difference, and as, his great, I don't know what, what you would put it, I suppose a mother goddess, Emily Dickinson, uh, would put it of possibility. So while the poems swarm with life and possibility, they are important things to say to us, both on a personal and, in a sense, on a wider cultural and public level. But one of the characteristics of Kit Fan's poetry is that it is acutely aware of the crucial differences between rhetoric and poetry. Reading through the Ink Cloud Reader, I was reminded of Mill's famous uh, dictum, 
rhetoric is heard, poetry is overheard. Well, these poems, thankfully, will be heard, hopefully, for, for a long time to come, but they are also, in a crucial sense, overheard. Um, there is a sense that we are eavesdropping on a mind in quizzical dialogue with itself and, and with the world at large, a kind of intimacy of tone, of voice, which we, uh, as readers, are permitted access to. And we are fortunate enough to be hearing them um, read by Kit himself tonight. So I am now, without further ado, going to hand over to Kit um, as he reads from the Ink Cloud Reader. Um, thank you, Katrina. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed by your beautiful introduction. Um, I'm not very good at dealing with praise, um, probably to do with my upbringing. So, uh, um, but I do feel praised by you um, and you're one of the poets that I really admire. And I was very, very moved when you talked about overhearing and I totally 100% agree with you that poetry is about overhearing and being overheard. Um, thank you everybody for being here on a beautiful <laughs> evening that probably we should be all outside rather than being stuck in front of the screen. But I'm very grateful for all of you being here uh, to help kind of launch my third book of poems into the world. Uh, I think Jess is going to, uh, I'm going to read about um, 20 to 25 minutes, but I'm going to start with a poem by Katrina, um, which is called Gore. I have this poem framed um, and sitting beside my bed. Um, so here it is, Gore by Katrina O'Reilly. Those from Aleppo were bitterest, yielding the vividest ink. More permanent than lamb black or bister, and at first pale gray, it darkened upon exposure to the exact shade of rain pregnant clouds. Since somewhere in the prehistory of ink is reproduction. A gall washed nursery, deliberate worm at the oak egg apple's heart. We knew the recipe by heart for centuries. We unlettered, tongueless, with hair of ash, the slattern at the pestle, the bad daughter. But who, but all who made marks on parchment or paper, dipped their pens in gore, in vitriol. Even the mildest of words like mellow fruitfulness or supplication like all I endeavor and decay equally in time with bare, barren, sterile. The pages corroding along all their script like a trail of ash. There is beauty in this. As the apple of Sodom, the gore turned in the hand from gold into ashes and smoke. This, this poem means a lot to me, um, and I've used it as an epigraph for one of my poems that I'm going to read. Um, it's called Mother's Ink. Um, my book has three sections. The second section is called Hong Kong, China. It documents essentially the time between 2019 um, and 2021 or 2022, um, the very difficult time in my city. Um, and Katrina's poem and this quote in particular gave me quite a lot of strength. Um, Mother's Ink, somewhere in the prehistory of ink is reproduction, Katrina O'Reilly. Born I was and wasn't. She drew breath from the breath she'd lost to phantom explosions inside her. 
three days, three nights, all breaths, and no food or sleep. What other mothers had done, she did, restaging the contractions until my departure. I saw what she saw, a cloud of messy flesh waiting at the gate, redder than ink. The hard plastic on the suction cap, my misshapen head. What she remembered, I remembered. A cloudless day at 3 p.m. and no ink was spilled as she kept herself to herself. Now and then, words escaped from her bleached hands. She knew I wanted ink greedily. She fed it to me, dark milk diluted with water that, when it touched a page, spread. She knew it came from the clouds, hiding the tear gas and bullets. She only wanted good ink for me, but feared what it meant. I wanted just ink for her. I wanted ink more than her. I'm going to move on to another poem called Raw Materials. Um, this poem documents the five days from the 21st of March to the 30th of March, 2021, the events that took place in Hong Kong. Raw Materials. Day one, a friend of a friend is shuffled out of a radio show. Another mouth shut, another man's whereabouts unknown. His due nationality scrapped. Day two, a bookseller's accused of crowdfunding a protest, evidence of systemic failure destroyed. Burberry is boycotted by some stars. Government tells 14 countries to deny the legality of a passport. Day three, a law firm is ordered to disband because they defend a case. A university access a photo exhibition. Day four, someone suspends a talk show, someone cancels a documentary, someone bans the Oscars, someone restricts someone's access to something official. Day five, another man is heard and charged. A law amended, police empowered, election candidates screened. So much of poetry is about memory, um, but I also think that the equal power of poetry is about forgetting. So the next poem is called Memosony, which pays homage to the goddess of memory. This is a poem for my friend in Hong Kong, Mimi. Memosony for Mimi. A million footsteps shaped the water movement as guns followed the eyes of cameras. Do you ever think of me a blind spot, a fawn on your side, a dismembered, disremembered joint decoration. Can't choose between the goddess of memory and forgetting, which is the alpha privative of thought. Not like flesh and blood, not like immortalized slogans on linen walls. 
found her in Mongkok, throwing herself into the pepper smoke. Lacrime, lacrime. Bang to be here in the divided capital of capital, in the sticky heat of chaos. Hunt him down, found him again on WhatsApp, hospital wards inside tunnels over bridges. They split as the blue dyed rain stained the running feet, the kneeling feet. Between flames and sirens, under shield and battens, they, which sheep from the flock would you remove? Resist and keep the city in the sovereign present in the foreign tongue. Dear friend, why on earth you jumped into the clouds? What worlds were there to encode? I'm going to move to the first section of the book, which is called Once Upon a Cloud. Um, these poems are, nearly all of these poems, actually all of them were written in 2021, which was a very bad year for me. Um, my beloved was very ill. Um, we were deep in the pandemic. So in the old days, when someone received chemotherapy, you could you could go to the chemo chemotherapy ward and have a party together when the drug was being administered. But during the pandemic, nobody was allowed to go into the chemotherapy ward. So um, in lieu of my absence, I decided to write a poem or so um, each time. So these are, the, in a way, chemo poems in a section. Well, I disguised them in the book. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, with a poem called You. You needles <clears throat> are used to create a chemo drug called docetaxel, which is a very powerful, one of the most powerful chemo drugs. Um, it's so powerful because it stops life. So I think life in a nutshell is about self being divided, self being split and recreate themselves. What's so powerful about these pine, uh, this you need those and those attacks is that it stops the cells from splitting, including the cancer cells, of course, but also other cells too. You, you walk into the dark heart of the you to stop the cells from dividing like the dew. The you walks intravenously into you, tightening the microtubules like a screw and all your internal scaffolding, once alive and askew, turns rigid, indivisible. Is the body's high cool to rot and blossom, overflowing us in a cool that ends in soil or fire. You walk into the you for a second chance, for an alternative avenue. And the you walks soundlessly into you as your hair thins out, muscles soften to tofu, and your lips turn metallic blue. Soon we walk together to Peru or Timbuktu, but first you must walk alone in the mind of the you. I'm going to move on to the next poem called Many Junes. Many Junes. Something bad happened. At the table, still zingy with basil, you drew black and opened 
your heart to the sour milk storm in our heads beyond counsel. Nothing heavy, just plain facts slid through the tongue, converting loss to some form of chaos. The eyes tasted, my eyes tasted salt and herbs. Papery purple and sun proud, it was the young sage, not the depths had hawk moth hovering sheepishly above us that broke me. The many dunes we had and might still have. Our time equation expanded as you added this, added that, the could haves and couldn't haves. I don't know how to subtract that from this, the colors from the frame. Our days so complete, it seemed a shame to be divided, not multiplied. The sun was strong, almost too strong. What was that thing bugging us, this living ones? I took the ink clouds from your frazzled hair, and all I could think of was rain. I'm going to move on to the next poem called Delphi. Um, Delphi was one of the most important ancient sites in Greece. Um, um, it carries the oracle, Delphi, Delphi, which was the most powerful oracle um, in the ancient world. Um, um, so the poem tried to recreate the pit, the columns in Delphi. There are six columns in total. You're seeing three. We'll move on to the next three. Um, but like many powerful things in the world, including the Delphi Oracle, um, the Oracle died in, I think, 600, 362 AD. Um, it died very abruptly and very suddenly. Um, the last Oracle was very well documented and it says, tell the um, emperor that my hall has fallen to the ground. Phoebus no longer has his house, nor his mantic bay, nor his prophetic spring. The water has dried up. Many people believe that this or last oracle in Delphi basically um, predicts the, the, the mission of Christ, the arrival of Christianity, and the end of all the oracles in the world. I was very taken by this last oracle because it is really talking about the death of future, a version of future, the death of poetry, because Phoebus mm, related to Apollo was very much the um, the guardian of poetry. Um, and it is a terrible thing to imagine poetry one day will die and 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 but terrible things do happen. Delphi. If time is heat traveling from hot to cold, when is the hour, date, location of my death? Would I be accompanied? Someone holding my hand, putting a bitter mint in my mouth? Would morphine be administered. How cold could my toes get before they fall off? Would there be a setting sun? If my severed head were to be frozen, could I still retrieve a memory file from 24th of August 2017, the swim I had up hill by the harbour in Trani, and the Mission star dinner that followed? Would it be possible to wrench the handmade tire tally with longer steams again? Or the risotto Nero? How much would the access cost? If I were to be cast away in the river of blood in the seventh circle with the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, would my husband be there? 
what equipment, if any, could withstand the barren plain of sand ignited by the flakes of fire? Would the guards take bribes? Would the fact that we were both decent swimmers help? If against the odds I were reincarnated as a Japanese maple, Higayasama, what would stop me from being turned into a bonsai tree? And if I cohib in cohabited well with the aphids and bullfinches, would I be personified in the next cycle? What sins should I accumulate to avoid being human again? If in the end there is nothingness, not even the ink and the clouds, would nothing then be left of me? What would happen to the books I read and the books I wrote? Would the memory of the pages I loved and the memory of my pages loved by others fade equally, fade away equally in the light years of reading? If what you told Oribasius is true and the speaking water has been silenced, why are the seas rising? Why do we have more kings with splendid halls sprouting high from the ground? And if Phoebus has lost his house and the laurel's tongue is cut, why am I here? What are the words that can never be silenced? Um, I'm going to move on to the last section of the book. There are, um, I'm going to read, these are shorter poems. Um, I'm going to read from the last section called Broken Nosed Jitsu, which is a god quite revered in Buddhism, um, but I'm not going to read that poem. I'm going to read a poem called from the Yaman Data Project. Um, it is a very important project. Uh, is a data collection project run by a charitable organization. They try to basically collect all the bombings happening in Yemen since the war began. Um, they collated it into a spreadsheet, often anonymously collated in order to protect the subjects. Um, you can download it, you can Google and you see the spreadsheet. From the Yemen data project. One. September was the coolest month with unguided clustered munitions, dispensing tennis ball sized bombs against soft skinned targets. But a shepnose spinning sky is impartial as to the month. Two, Sirwa, a key stop on the incense route where we found a plinth from the sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba was the most bombarded district with 1,101 airstrikes and rising. Three, the pivot table shows 55 rows beginning with the word civilians, farm, house, houses, truck, bus, boat, gathering, vehicle carrying vegetables and Abdullah El Hassan's Hassani's house up in the hills in Sinha leveled on 5th of August 2015. Four other targets beginning with the letter C celebration stage cement tanker cemetery central jail central organization for control and accounting, chicken farm, clinic, Coca-Cola factory, community college, cornfields with sightings of white Jones, cotton processing factory, court, crossing bridge, cultural hall, 
customs. Five, on the last Thursday of September 2015, in a wedding ceremony in the port city of Mocha on the Red Sea, where the prized olive colored coffee beans were shipped abroad, 80 fatalities were triangulated. 32 women, 38 children, but the time of day is unknown. Six, most of the time, the time of day is unknown, but if known, it takes place at midday when the sun bleaches away the fallen concrete blocks, loose wires, burned faces, or hands of those without faces. Seven, when a report does not note whether any fatalities occurred or not, or notes that it is unknown whether fatalities occurred at all, it defaults to coding zero as the fatality estimate. I'll move on to a poem called Apidaphros. Um, it is another amazing site in the ancient Greece. It's basically a beautiful spa town. Um, people went there to get their spa treatment and um, it is a place of healing. Um, it is also a place for the god of medicine, Asclepius. Um, his staff with the snake in the trining is used in the WHO logo because uh, we were told that if you're lucky after finishing a beautiful spa time, you go to sleep. And if you're the lucky ones, Asclepius snake will come near you, come to cl very close to your ear, and it will lick your ear, and then you will dream. And after the dreaming, you'll be healed. Apidaphros for Emily. Some nights separated from the sea, my eyes open like a gate without my brain in it. And the ink floods in through the sockets, dilating the pupils while I wait for Asclepius or someone like him with well-oiled ears licked by a snake to touch my dream in which I play all the Odysseuses yet to be translated, arguing with himself, failing to hear his mother's cry from the dark field littered with asphodels. And therefore the lines are abducted. So no reunion, no embrace, nothing left but white bones, as in foreign catastrophes reported by the world surface that trouble and soothe us, adding weight to my eyelids as a storm gathers in so Lundy and Fastnet, as if the sun, the sight of sea squirrels, the scent of pine, wild sage, and oregano alone could heal our first and last loves, the shattered eyes, burning hills, lost people of Yemen and recline. But I'm wading in, catching the spring water with my mouth and taking my share of every single moment. I'm going to end with the first poem in my book, and it's called Cuminolimbus. I think it's always great, good idea to end with a beginning. Um, Cuminolimbus are the, those crazy storm cows that are as tall as the Empire State Building. Um, um, I There are very many moments in the book that I feel like uh, this cow was kind of hovering over me. But I remind myself that the famous um, painter and printmaker Hokusai 
uh, Japanese master, ink master, Hokusai, he was struck by lightning at the age of 50, and he somehow survived it. And after that, his art became much more beautiful, much more heartbreaking. Um, and if he could survive a strike of lightning, and I would like to think that I could too. Um, so here you are, um, Cumin Olympus. Halfway through my life, the reeds by Makuru River, where the ducks made love, stop whistling. I fear I've over inked, or the linseed oil soured the sky. The wind tastes of oysters grilled over autumn soil. A fish draws a ripple, or did a wing drop win? My papers will soon topple the house before the tin roof falls. I better make haste and find a new address. A long legged fly by the watercress skates upstream, brazen faced. What I need now to change the half course of my life is to be struck by lightning and survive it like Hokusai. Thank you. Kit, thank you very much for that wonderful reading um, and congratulations on the uh, appearance of the Ink Cloud Reader. Um, I'm kind of glad that you ended with that poem, actually, because um, one of the things before I start, I just want to say, please do feel free to ask questions if they occur to you um, throughout the reading or during our little question and answer session here, because we'd love to hear from you. And one of the things that um, I mean, I've, I'm familiar with the book. I've read it a few times. Um, I, ha I had an earlier uh, reading of it and reading through it again, I realized that it left me. It's a book that really promotes questioning. Um, and I wanted to ask you one of the questions that occurred to me actually was um, that metaphor that happens in the poem Cumulo Nimbus about being struck by lightning, because I've heard you refer to this before. It's it's something that um, it seems to be an important metaphor. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of that image for you? It's almost about, it's felt like almost like a Lazarus moment without Jesus. If Jesus was a lightning bolt. <laughs> um, um, I think it was well documented that Hokusai was indeed struck by lightning. I think it's quite common in those days that um, even in Hong Kong, every summer people were struck by lightning. So um, people die, after, a lot of people die after being struck by lightning. And But in this case, Hokusai survived and his art somehow flourished immensely. And and I thought he had a Lazarus moment. and and. Every after re, often when I finish a book or finish a poem, I have this feeling that I would never write again. I would never write another poem, and then immediately another poem comes. <laughs> and um, I I think um, I'm, death has always been very close to me, and 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 even when I was very young, and I quite like that feeling actually. <laughs> that we're never. I, I'm very. I'm in the company of death, very in the vicinity. And it somehow kind of give me strings. And of course, this metaphor, what, whatever this incident in Hokusai's life um, was just too good not to be included in the poem. Um, well, one of the things that also is very apparent um, and thank you, by the way, for referencing goal there, which was rather cheeky of you, and I wasn't expecting it, but I'm glad that it spoke to you and perhaps to some of the poems in the book. Um, the metaphor of ink also obviously is uh, hugely pervasive. And one of the qualities 
really, I think, is that uh, interplay between opacity and transparency. Um, so, you know, a wash of ink is is um, is a transparent quality. And then there's a metaphor in one of the poems about um, looking into a mirror of ink, um, which reflects um, the speaker back to himself. Um, and it seemed to me that this is very much um, a kind of characteristic of your poetry, which I admire enormously, which is uh, the ability to um, know how to tread that line between showing and not showing or telling and not telling. Um, and that is a very difficult thing. It's one of the most difficult things I think to manage in, in poetry is, is, I mean, questions of tact come into it, um, but also how to manage difficult personal material. And actually um, in this book, as we see in the second section, especially, very daring um, references to wider public events and difficult and dangerous material, perhaps also. Um, so I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how conscious you are of how to work that material, material that is dangerous in a sense, either personally or in a wider way, um, how conscious you are of, ha of how you manage that. Does that make sense? What yeah. what you show and what you don't show to us? Yeah, I do. I mean, I love your question a lot, but I think this is something that I really wrestle with in the book. Um, um, I am extremely skeptical of the first person in poetry. Um, there is too much investment in the first person. And who cares about the first person when you have the second person or the third person? Um, but um, but it is impossible not to write from the first person. Um, so I set myself a challenge to to use the first person more in this book. But um, whoever that first person is, um, is trying to, as you said, shred that very tricky and fine line between telling and implying. Um, you talked about questioning. I think if poetry has to become has to be one thing, uh, it would have to be about questioning. Um, I'm much more interested in questions and answers in poetry. If a poem answers anything, uh, for me, it ceases to be a poem. So uh, it has to carry the question. Um, I suppose when a poem questions the world, oneself, or itself, it started looking at itself. I think a poem then basically pulls out the mirror and look at itself. I think that's when, when the poem becomes most interesting. And I think as a reader, I want to feel like I am being read. It's like when you go to the Oracle or you go to a fortune te and teller, you go to have your fortune read, your future read, you kind of know the story you want to hear. And then wh what, whoever the fortune teller or the Oracle tells you, you're going to twist it into a narrative that works for you. And, and I think, I think, if I could achieve a little bit of that in this book, um, I feel like I feel like I'm come closer to that moment uh, when Hokusai recovers from the lightning strike. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes me think again of your what I called your your sort of mother goddess, four mother goddess, Emily Dickinson, when she writes about. Uh, what is it? Wonder is not precisely knowing, and not pre not precisely knowing not. So holding the holding the poem open to possibility, to not not certainty, uncertainty, non certainty, um, that kind of thing. Um, you mentioned reading there, and uh, reading is another theme that runs very deeply through um, this book. I'm thinking in particular of the art of reading, which is a beautiful really one of my personal favorites, beautiful, beautiful prose poem, very moving. Um, 
but also, of course, in the title of the book, The Ink Cloud Reader, um, I notice that you don't, it's not a title, there isn't a title poem as such. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the title and its meaning. Um, God, this is an unexpected question, Katrina. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, this is a good question. Any unexpected question are very good questions. So um, the Ink Cloud Reader, um, what it means, um, it came to me, I think in the, there's a little kind of prelude poem in the book um, um, that tells a story of, of the Ink Cloud Reader. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, but I think, um, as I said, I want a clash of, of the definitive sense of ink, but actually it's full of liquid. Um, and in the past, when I, I remember using ink, the moment you put the ink on the page, you cannot predict where it goes. And it has a strong affinity with cloud because um, clouds are very unpredictable and there are lots of them in the United Kingdom and Ireland. <laughs> um, in, these, in those moments, especially in 2021, those kind of darker moments, I look at the sky, into the sky, through the sky, and I feel like I'm kind of reading these clouds, which sometimes look like ink for me. Um, and those moments I think were as if I was trying to read the oracles. And, and I feel like I've become a reader of my own life, which is a very strange feeling. Um, and then when I wrote these poems and I, when I reread this poem and put these poems together, I feel like I'm, more a reader of these poems than <laughs> the writer of these poems. In a very strange sense, I almost externalize the experience of writing to the point that I feel like I want to be the reader more than the writer because there could be a parallel universe when the title could be the Incal writer. Um, but, but I decided that the reader I'm more of a reader than a writer here. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a book that it's also about reading, isn't it? In a, in a really deep sense, I think. Yeah. Um, and reading is referenced, you know, throughout. Um, so one of the, I think, before I, I uh, start to take questions from um, our participants, one of the things that I wanted really to ask you about, um, and one of the ways in which you obviously, you know, a poet can escape from the first person <laughs> and the, all of that is through the, is through form, is through the externalization of these impulses uh, through form. And the the book is incredibly form, formally various. I mean, you really, there is such a sense of play and uh, mutability and change through form in the book. So could you tell us a little bit about, it's a terrible question, I know, and I know that poets really hate it, but it is an important question, is that how, what does form mean to you? What does poetic form mean to you? Um, what meaning does it have for you? How conscious is it? Um, how yeah. pre, sort of pre-programmed is it for you? And, and does it emerge as you write? Well, it's a terrible question, but you asked it very beautifully and invitingly, so <laughs> I will answer it. <laughs> Um, I think form for me is the sixth sense for a poet. Uh, so if you have sight, taste, touch, smell, what's the other senses? <laughs> um, hearing. <laughs> hearing, yeah. You know, the sixth sense will have to be form. Um, it's a sense that makes, gives you access to the other senses. It gives you, it will give you um, a license to take risks, to, to be naughty, to let your hair down and go crazy on the page. 
that, that is it a sort of safety net in that sense does it protect you from from chaos from the risks i tend to try to break the form so uh i actually i think it does protect i mean it's like if you go for bungee jump uh you want the, you want the string to be there but on some level you also want you the sensation of falling <laughs> that's why you want to jump so um i think for me i try to break it i always try to break it and 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 there are, um, by breaking it sometimes i think is using rhyme because rhymes are so underrated these days if you uh, i think if you rhyme people say oh my god is this poetry can you write poetry that rhymes <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I actually throw in a lot of crazy rhymes, especially in the first section, um, because I found that the rhyme, I also break them like crazy, um, um, because I think, yeah, I want to take risks in this book because I feel like I have nothing to lose. <laughs> but poetry, um, poetry is to have fun with, not, not to, not to um, in my view anyway, it's a playground. <laughs> yeah, and I think there is a really strong sense here of of play and of the pleasure, you know, the pleasure of play. A lot of pain as well, but play in a sense of kind of redemptive power at the same time. Um, well, I have lots of other questions, but we have sort of run out of time for my questions. So I'm going to um, have a look at, uh, we have one question in the question and answer box. If you have any others, please do let us know. This is from... Katie Evans Bush, uh, who says, I'm so struck by the poems about Hong Kong and also Yemen. And I guess I want to ask about this kind of political poetry, poetry of outrage or grief, or as Shelley said, poets as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. What is your take on this? Um, thank you, Katie, for, for your very pertinent questions. Um, as someone who was brought up in Hong Kong, um, I lived there for 21 years. And and even though I'm severed from it now, um, it is almost impossible not to not to have a city that is so splintered, not to be impinged by it, um, and not to be impinged by it in my writing. So instead of avoiding it, there are many reasons to avoid it. Uh, um, including the national security law, um, I, I decided I would try to find a way to write my home city. Um, um, I did not feel, I didn't feel the kind of, oh my God, I, I, I am a poet from Hong Kong, therefore I have to write about Hong Kong. This is my responsibility. I really did not think that when I started writing these poems. I, and some I wrote this some of these poems mainly because I'm responding to the experiences of my friends, the stories they told me, um, the nights, long distance phone call that I spent with them, um, in those kind of terrible light nights. Um, so they are more like love letters than um, for me anyway, to them, than, um, than grand gestures like legislator or, yeah, I, I don't see, see it like that. Um, but I am framing it within a section. I want the reader to understand these poems are, are all related. Um, they are about Hong Kong, China, um, and I wanted want them to be read as a suite of love letters. Thank you, Kit. Um, I have another question here from Laurie Donaldson. Lots of play in the poems, yes, but the subject is often very serious. How do you manage to combine these opposites? Yes. Can you play seriously? <laughs> or can you seriously play? Um, I think we do that all the time, don't we? Um, I certainly do it in my day job. 
um, not as a poet. Um, I I think, but this is a very legitimate question. I often think I one thing that I worry about is, oh my god, is my book too heavy? Is it too dark? Blah blah blah. Uh, but then, ultimately, these are the feelings I have. Uh, what I try to do, and I said to Katrina, is that using that sixth sense, using the form to tell, to kind of channel the energy of the poem on a page. So you will see, like the poem that I read, Memosony, pretty difficult materials. And I decided that um, when friends told me about their memory of what happened in Hong Kong during those difficult times. It's surprising that a lot of them also said that they in almost always forget. They forgot a lot of the things they, they should remember. And, um, and I thought, actually, can I invent a form uh, in which the materials are random, scattered on a page, but they also seem to be fading um, as a way to challenge the goddess of Mimosony. Um So so you're right. I mean, I try to be playful with the form to deal with some pretty difficult subject. I hope it works. I hope, but I'm not sure all the time. But what I'm sure of um, is that I wanted to take risks with these poems. On the theme of, I, I guess, play and pleasure, um, uh, there's a question from Laura Blomvold, who says, there was a lot of food and pleasure in food in the poems that you read. Is the culinary an important register to you in writing poems? A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a food lover, oh, Katrina, you know that. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> I think it's not only in poems for me. Uh, poetry is very important uh, for me in my life. If I have to choose between poetry and food, I would choose every day of the week food. Yeah, I can live without poetry, but I cannot live without good food. So um, I, I don't think they are even on the same rank. So, 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 so there you go. That's total heresy. It is, yeah, for a poet to say terrible. that. But I'm also a food eater, so. <laughs> True. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one last question. Um, this one is from Michelle Kelly. Um, and she says, I was so struck by seeing the poem on the page and hearing you read up and down, left to right, right to left, and then ending with the beginning. How does one know where to start reading? Where does the order come from? Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, I think it. I love the way you talk about the multi directional uh, thing. So when I thought um, about the reading today, I thought I'm, I'm not going to do things chronologically because there's not a lot of fun in chronology. Um, uh, recently, I was in Lisbon um, in working in the museum and I was talking to curators about chronology because art historians or curators are obsessed with chronology. Uh, and poets don't need to be obsessed with chronology. So, so um, I was using my poetic license to be extremely contrary. Uh, um, I think um, in how do a reader, how do readers begin to read? Uh, I op when I open a book, a book of poems. So it, I'm just talking about my experience. I usually just flip through it to look at what the shape look like, and I will read the first poem. And if it's good, I will continue to read and if, if it's very good then I follow it through but if it's not very good I probably would just skip to the last poem to see what it's all about if the last poem doesn't redeem whatever it is for me I put it down <laughs> um, I think we all do that as a reader yeah we are pretty ruthless so let's face it um, um, I like the ruthlessness of readership uh, because I am one and I've seen if you go to bookstore you see people be picking up books as many times as they put it down and 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 we as readers are ruthless and we should celebrate that ruthlessness in us but poetry of course lends itself to that very non-linear 
uh, you know, dipping in and out and, and kind of non-linear reading in a way, in a way that a novel never does, for instance, as well, true. isn't it? That's true. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much to everybody who um, has joined us and enjoyed the reading tonight and for asking questions. Um, thank you so much, Kit, for that wonderful reading and congratulations you, again. Um, and I will now hand back to Jasmine. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you for your beautiful reading kit. It was amazing to hear you read from this book. Um, I thank you, Katrina, for, for hosting with your questions and for um, fielding the audience questions. Um, it was great to hear from you guys. Thanks for your messages in the chat and thanks for your questions and everything. Um, I did just put the link in the chat for you again, so you can go and buy your copy of the book with the discount code. Um, if you're in the States or in Canada, then um, you won't be able to purchase the book from us, I'm afraid. Um, so in that case, we just thank you for paying your money to be here. Um, but if you're in the UK or anywhere else in the world, please follow the link um, and buy yourself a copy. Um, it'll come as an email tomorrow, like I said as well. So if you have any problems accessing um, our website or getting a copy of the book, just let us know and we'll help you. Um, so the last thing for me to say is please join us again next time. Um, I'm putting a link in the chat for you again there. Um, on the 10th of May, we're launching Jory Graham's new collection. She's going to be talking to Robert McFarlane. Um, so please register for that and um, sign up to our newsletter so that you can be up to date with what's going on online. So that's everything. Um, I'm going to leave the chat open for your like last minute messages for a few minutes. But um, thank you from us and thank you to you guys. Um, and thank you, Jasmine. Congratulations. And thank you, Carbonet. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Thank you Thank all you. for coming. <laughs>